So today we are going to change gears and we're going to be looking at the foundations of Islam. Now once again guys, our theme verse for the class, I expect all of you to memorize it, okay? 1 Corinthians 1.18, let's, shall we say it together? For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. Amen. So let's put that to memory. Let's memorize it. I'm actually going to be doing that memory verse with my kids and in my home. We put it up on a whiteboard, and, and I like to do memory verses with my kids to, boy, what better thing than knowing who's on TV or baseball figures or, bat, you know, the Word of God needs to get into the homes. Amen? So let's do that. Um, so we're going to be looking at the foundations of Islam, and boy, there's a lot of things we're going to touch on today, okay? So a lot of information. I gave you all of my notes, okay? So you guys have all of the class notes. So we're going to be looking at each of those areas, and we're, there's going to be two parts to this, okay? So this week and then next week, the foundations of Islam. And then... Now you're going to have a good understanding, a solid understanding of Islam. And then we're going to look into the objections that the Muslims have. And then we're going to look at communicating the gospel to our Muslim friends. Now I first am going to greet you. I'm also going to be putting together um, some phrases. I'm, I'm planning to put together, maybe along with the help of my wife, um, an index of words, keywords, just some keywords of spiritual vocabulary English and then Arabic. I'm going to put it in a way where it's phonetic so that you can read it, okay? But first I'm going to greet you in the Arabic greeting, okay? And hopefully all of you can learn this, okay? Because you just know this one greeting, and I, I, I'm not, I tell you the truth. If you just memorize simply how to say hello to a Muslim, you will see their face brighten up with a smile. I can't tell you how many times just simply saying to them, okay? So in Arabic, it's salam wa alaikum. Okay? So this is what I would advise you to do. Salam. Okay, write it down the way you hear it. This is how I learned Arabic. Write it down the way you hear it. Salam. Okay? Some people, you may hear say salam. Okay? Salam. Okay? Salam. This is the word for peace. In Hebrew, what is it? Shalom. In Arabic, it's salam. Okay? So, salam. U. U. Alaykum. Alaykum. Right. Alaykum. So, when you run that all together, salam wa alaykum. Now, you guys don't have to learn the a. Ah. Because there is a little ah there that will be hard. But if you want to, you're welcome to do that. But it's salam wa alaykum. Okay? In Arabic, they have a cup. They have some, uh, uh, some alphabets that are difficult. Some of their pronunciation, some vowels. Um, and one of them is the a'in. Okay? So it's salam wa alaykum. Okay? And literally, you are saying, peace be upon you. Okay? And it's in the plural. Yes, salam, peace. Ualay means upon. Kum is you guys. So you're actually saying to the plural because the singular, once I could go on in it forever, but salam walik would be to you, singular. But alaykum is the plural. Because in the Islamic culture, you are greeting, they, they use the plural. Now, this is the way I was explained to me is because they believe that they have an angel of recording the good deeds on one shoulder and an angel recording the bad deeds on the other shoulder. Okay? And on judgment day, those deeds will be taken into balance. Good works versus the bad works. Okay? But that's how you greet, okay, a Muslim. If you want to wanna come on their level and you want to talk and you want to greet them, just say, Salamu alaikum. Okay? And boom, you will break the ice. I tell you that. Okay? So go for it. Try it. Supermarkets, your friends, tell them, Salamu Alaikum. And they will say, Wow! <laughs> okay? Peace be upon you. Peace to you, yeah. Salamu Alaikum. Salam. U. Alaikum. Alaikum. 
Right. Some people say salam alaikum. Okay, they kind of just run it. But there is, I, I can't explain the, gram the grammar of it, okay? But it's salamu alaikum. Okay? <laughs> So let's, let's, let's start here. So, beginning the foundations of Islam, the first thing that I want to share with all of us is that it's important to remember 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1, which says, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. So you know, in every class we take, in every course we take, whether it be theology, whether it be foundations of our faith, whatever it may be, studying Islam right now, we are going to gain a lot of knowledge. And knowledge is good. But remember, God's word says, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. So we need to take the knowledge we are receiving today and the rest of these classes and then mix it with love and boom. In the hands of the Holy Spirit, you will be a powerful vessel. Okay? So, first of all, we're going to look at Islam and the word Muslim defined. So this was taken from uh, an Arabic website concerning the, the meanings of Islam and a Muslim. Islam is derived from the Arabic word salama, meaning peace, means purity, submission, and obedience. Okay, it means all of these things. And many times, by the way, in the Arabic language, it is an amazing language. It is a beautiful language. Because one word can have multiple meanings. I've been told that they have 70 words for the word lion. For lion, they have 70 different words just for the word lion. So, I mean, that just gives you an idea of the vastness, you know, of the language. It's a beautiful language, okay? So, in the religious sense... Islam means submission to the will of God and obedience to his law. Everything and every phenomenon in the world other than man is administered totally by God-made laws. That is, they are obedient to God and submissive to his laws. They are in the state of Islam. Man possesses the quality of intelligence and choice. Thus, he is invited to submit to the good will of God and obey his law. That is, become a Muslim. Submission to the good will of God together with obedience to his beneficial law. That is, becoming a Muslim is the best safeguard for man's peace and harmony. Okay, Muslim means, and once again, the correct word, guys, is Muslim. Okay, we, a lot of times in the West, we say Muslim. Okay, but when you're, when you're speaking to them, if, I'm just telling you the right way. It's okay if you don't, but you're going to say Muslim. Okay, because the verb is salim, okay, or slim. So Muslim means submitted or someone who is submitted. Okay, it is a person who is submitted. So in the word salama, do you see the word from Islam, which, which comes, which is where we get the word submission or peace, you have Muslim. Okay, whenever in the Arabic language you have mu, it literally means the person or the agent who does the verb. So it's the person who submits. Okay? So, Muslim means someone, someone who is submitted to Allah, a follower of the religion of Islam. The Muslim in relation to God is as a slave to a master who must obey unquestionably or face God's judgment. In contrast, as a Christian, we are called children of God, and God is our heavenly Father, a love relationship versus a legal one driven by fear. And this is one of the huge differences, okay? In Islam, they are driven by fear. They are driven by fear, and their, their relation with their God, Allah, is that of a slave to a master. And however, even though we are also servants of God, but Jesus, and in, in the word of God, we are told that we are now sons and daughters of God. We are now called children of God. But now when you are talking with a Muslim, and if you talk about that, and we're going to touch on that later on, when you say something like that, you are a child of God, they're going to understand that literally. And that's where the problem lies. So they're going to say, okay, so you're a child of God. So then you're saying to me that God is married and produced you. So right away they just go, Phew. so of course, you know, and if I, 
if I understood it that way too, I would say, well, yeah, it's wrong. So when I've talked to them and I've said to them, look, what you believe, what you think we believe, I don't even believe that. And there's not one Christian in the world who believes that God had a wife and produced us children or Jesus. And that we're going to go on that later on, that he's the son of God. So right away they think literal. And that's why they say you and I are blaspheming and the Bible's blaspheming. Well, if it's on that, if that's the definition, yes, but we're not. So once again, defining terms. And it's the same way with many of you know with the cults. You have to define, okay, Jesus, wait, who is Jesus to you, right? Well, Jesus is Michael the archangel or Jesus is a God. Okay, well, we need to define our terms, okay? So now we're going to look at a brief history of Islam. <laughs> So this is as brief as I could get, okay, because there is a lot, there's a lot of history um, in Islam. But this is going to give you a summary and understanding of the origins, where it came from, and what happened, and where it is uh, up until now. Okay, so pre-Islamic Arabia, the city of Mecca was a prominent center for commerce and well-known for poetry. Okay, Mecca is the center of the Islamic world today. All right, you know, it's, as you may know, it's in, the, it's in this country of Saudi Arabia. And before Islam came, we're going to find out that there were many tribes. It was desert. Many tribes were running that area, and there was a lot of idolatry, okay? But it was well known in Mecca for poetry. And that's why Muslims proud themselves in the, the Quran, because the Quran is very poetic in the way it reads. There's a lot of r rhyme and rhythm, okay? And they actually pride themselves in the poetry and in a lot of the Arabic poetry. And it was well known for that in those days. The dominant tribe was the Quraysh tribe. Okay, you may have heard that, that Muhammad came from the Quraysh tribe. There was a lot of pagan Arab idolatry, okay? As I said, that prevailed. It was completely given over. And, and if you will, there was a space. You know, the, the gospel had gone gone into the Roman world, but it's amazing. You look at that part of the world, you see the Middle East, and it was almost as if it just got hardly touched. It was untouched, that desert region, and it was given over to pagan idolatry. The Kaaba was for idol worship, okay? There was a place in Mecca, which today, if you, if you were to go on the internet and type in Mecca or type in this word, the Kaaba, you're going to see where every Muslim in the world faces to pray five times a day. They are facing, when they pray, they must pray to the east, okay? So a Muslim will get out his prayer rug, put it on the floor, find out where is the east. You know, we've had friends, you know, when we lived in Morocco, friends would come over to our house, we would have dinner and stuff, and then when they'd say, oh, it's time for prayer, or they would hear the call to prayer, right away they would, they would look around and they would want to go to a clean place. And they would want to pull out their prayer rug and just pray, you know, and, f and they have to face towards Mecca, okay? So Mecca has the place called the Kaaba, and before Muhammad came, it was used for idol worship. The Kaaba's origin, very interesting. If you check out Acts 19.35, there's an interesting parallel there. Most probably what, ha what happened is that they built this place around a meteor because what it was they say that it was a white rock but over the years it has become black because of man's sin that it took on itself so basically the Kaaba in Mecca what you see now if you go and you google it on the internet you will see a big black box a huge black black box and you will see hundreds of thousands of Muslims going round in circles okay and this is part of their, their pilgrimage that they, that they should do. But this Kaaba is inside of that black box is a rock, okay? And they have a lot, what their belief is, is that they believe that Abraham and Isaac, or Abraham rather and Ishmael, actually set it up. That they established this rock there a long, long time ago. And so Muhammad found it. And there they came and they found it. And, and these pagans actually just idolized it and began to worship and pray to the rock. And so we're going to see what happened with, with Muhammad. But it's interesting because in Acts 19.35, Paul talks about a similar thing. He said that object which fell from Zeus. And so it seems that in those days, something also like a meteorite fell from heaven and they began to worship 
that rock as an idol. And so it's a really interesting, the parallel. Islamic historians refer to this period as jahiliya, which means times of ignorance. This is really interesting because if you were to look at Islamic history, this period, when Islam came, they called this period the times of ignorance. People were in the dark. They were ignorant. You know, and I find it really interesting when you actually think about even European history. You know, we talk about the Dark Ages. And do you realize some of the reasons why we call it the Dark Ages? The Bible was only in the, in the language of Latin. And people did not have the Bible translated in their own language. You know, I even, my own father told me that he used to go to the Roman Catholic Church with his mom and the whole service was in Latin. And he would ask his mom, Mom, what did they say? And she would, she would have tears in her eyes and she would say, I don't know. And so that's actually what prevailed then in the Dark Ages where the people did not have the Bible in their own language. And this is what was happening then. People were in ignorance. People were worshiping idols. And so Muhammad's, Muhammad comes along. So Muhammad's birth in 570 A.D. in Mecca of Arabia, and he died in 632 A.D. in the city of Medina. And also the word Medina, it's, it's not only the name of a city, but Medina in Arabic means city. Okay? It also means city. It means city. Now next, Muhammad's early life. His parents were Abdullah and Amina. Abdullah, you may, you may have, have friends that are called Abdullah, or you've heard of that. That literally means abd, which means slave or servant of Allah. Okay, servant of God, Abdullah. And his mom, Amina. His father died when he was very young, and he was raised by his grandfather, Abd al-Mutalib. And then at eight years old, he was raised by an uncle, Abu Talib. Um, during his younger years, Muhammad was involved in... He was a merchant, so he was around a lot of caravans that came through Saudi Arabia, that came through there. There were a lot of Jews, Christians, people that came in caravans, trading. And he was around a lot of merchants, and he was also a shepherd. At age 25, he married his first wife, Khadija. Khadija. The K-H will be pronounced Kh, okay, <laughs> if you can do that. Khadija. It's fun to say. So she was 40, okay? He was 25, she was 40, and she was a very wealthy woman. They had seven kids. And the interesting thing, three, the, all of the boys died. They had seven kids together, four girls, three boys, all three boys died. And the girls remained. So now moving along, the first revelation. So now when the very first revelation came to Muhammad, it began in 610 A.D. in a cave called Hira, supposedly from the angel Gabriel. Okay, now, I'm not going to go, once again, I don't have enough time to go in depth, okay? But this is what happened, just like, and it's very, very interesting. And you know what? When you study the scriptures, and when you look around, and you study world religions, and you study cults, you see that Satan does, he just does the same thing, but he just changes the mask a little bit. But you just look at Mormonism and you look at Islam and there's a lot of parallels, a lot. And I've told multiple Muslims, I said, you know exactly what you're telling me? I said, there is a man, there's one man, Joseph Smith. Have you ever heard of him? Never. I mean, every single Muslim in Morocco has never heard of Joseph Smith. I said, do you know that there are millions of followers of this religion called Mormonism? And they're like, really? And I said, How? you prove to me that they're not true. They have millions of people following them. How do we know they're not true? Because that man also said that he was a prophet. And he went off by himself. And this is exactly what Muhammad did. He went off by himself. And he went up. And if you look at Mecca right now, where the pilgrims come, it is in a valley. And up in the mountain there, overlooking that whole valley, is where he, where he stayed. And he meditated by himself. And I'm sure, you know, he was pondering and thinking about all of these things. And that's where the enemy met him. Okay, in this cave. And in this cave... He believed that it was the angel Gabriel who brought him the revelation of the Quran. Okay, so his first revelation came in 610 in this cave. Now, moving along, the Meccan period. So, 
Now Muhammad receives what he believes from God, his um, apostleship, his uh, call, if you will, to be a messenger for Allah. And now the Meccan period. So the following grew over the next 12 years. So for the following, the next 12 years in the city of Mecca, his following grew. More and more people began to follow him and follow his, uh, what he was proclaiming as Islam, the new religion. Persecution also increased from pagan idolaters. Then we go on to the next period, the Hijrah. The Hijrah. Being opposed heavily in 622 AD, Muhammad journeyed from Mecca to Medina, 200 miles northwest, to spread Islam and establish his new base of operations. So he was going, he was under a lot of persecution from a lot of these idolaters, and he took his troops and he headed northwest, 200 miles from Mecca to Medina. Okay, and they call that, that's why you get the word Hajj. I don't know if you ever, if any of you have heard the word Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca. In Arabic, it's called Hajj, which means pilgrimage. So there you have the word Hijra, comes from the root word Hajj, okay? Anyways, beginning of Islamic calendar. So this began the Islamic calendar. When they went from Mecca to Medina, that's when their calendar, which the, the Muslims follow, the Islamic calendar, that's when it began, okay? So the Islamic is based on a lunar cycle referred to as A.H., versus our Gregorian calendar. Okay, and you can look that up once again on, on the internet. I'm not gonna go into detail about that, but it's, there's differences, okay? Now, Muhammad's years in Medina. Over the next 10 years, Islam spread by conquest to neighboring lands, conquering Jewish and Christian communities, as well as pagan tribes. The succession to Muhammad, once Muhammad died. You have, of course, now in the, in the sect, one sect of the Sunni Islam, they believe the succession went from Abu Bakr to Omar to Uthman to Ali, known as the four rightly guided caliphs. Okay, we say caliphs. It comes from the Arabic word khalif, okay, which means someone who is guided. Okay. The Shiite Islam believe in 12 imams. An imam is a person, a leader, who stands in front of the people and leads. The first of which is Ali up to Mehdi, who did not die, but was taken up or hidden by God. Now, of course, this is what, this is Islam, okay? This is what they believe. Or hidden by God. This is also a lesser occultation. And whom will return to set up his kingdom at the end of time. So this is what the Shiite Muslims believe versus what the Sunni Muslims believe, okay? So throughout the, the following years, you see a lot of the offensive wars of Islam. Multiple campaigns, multiple wars. There is so much history, there are so many things that went on, and a lot, a lot of wars. And once again, when, when, many times when you're talking, I don't like to get on this subject. To me, it's some people get involved in it and start talking about the history, unless you really know, which I don't know a whole lot of this, so I don't even involve that. It's really not that important, you know, but sometimes they will get defensive and Muslims will begin to say, no, these were wars of defense, not of offense, you know. But it all comes down to Christ. He said, he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. And one of the huge differences is I say to every Muslim, Jesus said we are to spread the name of Christ through this, simply the preaching. We're not to fight. We're not to make war, but through the preaching of the gospel. And also through the blood of the saints, because we see through our history, and I've said this before, our book is a bloody book. And that's why we as Christians need to hold this, the word of God, so precious. Because people literally gave their very life, shed their blood so that we can have this in English. And we could have the Bible today. So we have a bloody book, but it was not because of war. As far as what Christ commanded, it was because of the preaching. And then you have, of course, the expansion of Islam. For the past 1,300 years, Islam has continued to spread through both military conquest and proselytism. Proselytism in Arabic is dawah. Okay. Now, moving along to the sects of Islam. Okay, you have primarily the two major sects, okay? Just as, you know, in Christianity you have Protestantism and Catholicism, okay? 
in Islam you have these two major sects. The majority are Sunni, okay? So 80 to 85% of the Islamic world are Sunni. So most of the material in this class will apply to the Sunni because they are the dominant sect. Sunnis recognize the first four Khalifs as legitimate successors to Muhammad, the four there mentioned. The dispute over who should be the legitimate successor has resulted in fundamental political and religious differences between Sunnis and Shiites. Okay, and then I gave you here Khalif in Arabic, Khalif, which means a successor of Muhammad as temporal and spiritual head of Islam. Okay, the Shiites, they are 15% of all Muslims, predominantly in Iran, part of Iraq, and part of Lebanon. Shiites recognize only Ali as the legitimate successor to Muhammad, since Ali was the son-in-law of Muhammad. They reject the first three Khalifs as illegitimate. They regard the Imam as infallible and as God's messenger to mankind today. Shiites do not accept all the Hadith accounts that Sunnis do. Okay, the Hadith now is other books that are extra, if you were, you know how we say extra biblical? If you would say extra Quranical, okay? Outside of the Quran, which is the Muslim's holy book, their main holy book is the Quran, you have the Hadith. And the Hadith is, it literally means the tradition of the things Muhammad taught, the way he lived, what he said. Everything was recorded by his friends, those that were around him. And most Muslims, the Sunni especially, will follow not only the Quran, but also what's, find, what's found in the traditions of Muhammad. So, I mean, even to the point of, okay, Muhammad grew his beard no more than a fist's length. So they will grow it only a fist's length. And a lot of Sunni Muslims, they will have only, um, let's see, they'll have the beard and they will not have a mustache. So, I mean, to that specificity, I mean, really specific things. I mean, they literally just, they imitate exactly what Muhammad did. You know, if he, ate, if he ate his soup, first one spoonful and then paused for two minutes, they'll do the same thing, you know. So, just to give you an idea. Then you have another sect here also, the Sufis. This is a mystical sect of Islam, believes completely different from both Sunni and Shiite, a small minority sect. So keep in mind the differences which affect them, okay? So depending on the Muslim you're talking to, they could be a Sunni, they could be a Shiite, okay? I doubt you'll run into a Sufi, but you might, all right. Now this is the more important here, the articles of belief. Okay. <clears throat> In Arabic, it's called Arkan el Iman. Arkan el Iman. Okay, Arkan means the articles. El Iman. El is the, and then Iman is belief or faith. Okay? So, God. Allah is a general term for God used by Muslims, Arabic Christians, and Jews. Okay, now this is uh, many, many Christians, many people wonder, have this question. Should we be using the word Allah when we're talking to a Muslim? Okay, yes, you should. Okay? We've been in Morocco for 13 years. We've ministered to Muslims. You use the word Allah because it is the only word used by Muslims, Arabic Christians, and Jews. When you pick up an Arabic Bible, the word for God is Allah. Okay, now let's, let's look further. Literally, the is Al and God is Elah. Okay, so in Arabic, the only word for God is Allah. Okay, there is no word for God. It's like if you were ministering to somebody in Spanish and you said, well, I'm not going to use Dios. So I'm going to use Señor. Well, Señor is Lord, right? There is no other word for God. There's Dios, okay? But now who is Dios? You understand? This is the key issue. Who is God? The God that is revealed in the Quran is not the God, not the true God. He is not the God who came and revealed to us the scriptures and, gave, and brought us salvation. So we're going to look in that, okay? Now remember, I'm going to have um, about 15 minutes of questions and answers later on. So if you want to hold any questions, if you want to write down or jot anything down, you're welcome to do that, okay? So, El Elah might be connected to an ancient pagan god. Many scholars do not agree unanimously on this point. I read a lot of stuff. 
a lot of things. Some people say this, some people say that. Some people say, well, this was the moon god in Mecca along, um, amongst the plethora of other gods. Okay, in Arabic, like I said, in the Arabic language, there is no other word for God but Allah. Okay, so he, that is God. Now, they also, in the Arabic Bible, we have the word for Lord. Okay, um, so, and then, of course, the other descriptions of who our God is, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so Islam is a monotheistic religion, just as is Christianity and Judaism. You need to know that. That's important. Okay, and once again, you're going to see here in these articles of belief that we're going to look at today, there is a lot of common ground that you have with the Muslims. And that is one of the wonderful things that makes it a bit easier than sharing with someone that does not believe in God. I don't believe in a creator. I don't believe, okay, they, you're going to see they believe in God. Just, just look at some of these articles of belief. God, prophets, the holy books, angels and demons, divine decree, final judgment, man. Okay, these are what they call their articles of belief. So a lot of common ground with Christians. So they believe that God has always existed. Allah is all-powerful. They believe he's omnipotent. And there you have the, the references in the Quran. Okay, now I encourage you, if you want, go on to the internet and go on to uh, find an online Quran for yourself. Okay? Um, I use one. I believe it's www.searchtruth.net okay and there you have like a little search engine you can type in any word in English and then it can pull up all the references in the Quran of that word and you have different translations from Arabic into English okay but check out some of these verses from the Quran okay now when we say surah surah is a chapter okay if you will or a book Okay, in the Quran, you have, for example, the, four, the first surah would be like, we would say Genesis and Exodus. So surah 1 is Fatiha. Surah 2 would be Baqarah, which, is, which means cow. So you have the book of Fatiha, the book of the cow, the book of the ant. You can check it out on the internet. There's all the different chapters or books in the Quran, okay? So you have the chapter, surah 2, and then verse 106. Okay, so they believe God is all-powerful. They believe he's omnipresent. There's references. Everything that happens on earth is of Allah's will. Nothing occurs that Allah has not already willed to happen, including man sinning, the presence of evil in the world, and other things. So this is where it gets really interesting. They believe everything is from God, include evil and man sinning from God. There is no free will for mankind. Everything is controlled by Allah. Allah is impersonal. He does not have a relationship with his creation. Muslim relationship with Allah is that of a master and a slave rather than father-son relationship in Christianity. So once again, when you are com conversing with a Muslim, they cannot understand that concept. They cannot understand that concept. But we have to be careful to define what we mean. Okay, we're not speaking of a physical relationship, but we're talking about a spiritual relationship that God has adopted us into his family. And what's interesting is that they have in the Quran a lot of things that are almost have a spiritual meaning or a metaphorical meaning. You know, for example, in the Bible, we have where the Bible says abiding under the shadow of his wings. So is God a big chicken? No. Is God, does God have wings like a, like a bird? No. That is a metaphor for his protection. Okay? In the same way, in the Quran, it says that God sits on the throne. And God sees. So I've asked him and I said, so does God have eyes? How does he see? Does he have two eyes? When he sits, how does he sit? Like what, 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 what does his seat look like? What, what is his, his form? His shape? What does he sit on? Like we sit on our bottom. What does he sit on? And so the same thing, they talk about God seeing. So does he have eyes? Well, no, he doesn't have eyes like a man. Okay, so then you're beginning to break them, take them out of the box. So in the same manner, we have the same thing. There are, there are metaphors, okay? And we're talking about here a spiritual relationship. Now in Islam, there is what's called shirk. Okay, do you see that? Shirk. 
Shirk is the word in Islam to attribute to others the qualities of deity reserved for Allah alone, to equate others with Allah. Christians are guilty of shirk because we equate Jesus Christ with God. Okay? Now, once again, when we say Jesus is God in the flesh, in their mind, that is blasphemy. That is shirk to them because you are equating a man with God. And I'll just tell you really quick, I'm just going to tell you one line right here. But this is really, I heard this a long time ago and I never forgot it. The issue is this. When we say that Jesus is God, we are not saying a man became God, but we're saying God became a man. That is very key. Because in their mind, they're hearing a man. You're saying a man becomes God. But we're not saying that. We're saying the eternal God became a man. Okay? Because the one is impossible, but the other is possible. And we'll talk about that later on. Allah does not have a son in Islam. He needs nobody else to accomplish his will. And there you have all of the different references. Allah cannot be known. He is so transcendent as to be unknowable. Okay, once again, there is no intimate relationship as we have with God. You know, guys, when you sit and if you share your testimony with a Muslim, and especially, let me share this with you. When you share how Christ and how God is moving in your life today, that is powerful. Because me and my wife sat with a family that we know in Morocco. The man is saved, but his wife is unsaved. And his wife doesn't know that he's a believer. Okay, and we sat with her and we shared and I said to her, I said, Muna, do you know that God speaks to me? And she's like, and I said, do you know that God has answered many of my prayers? I said, has God ever answered your prayers? And be specific. And I told her one after another where God has specifically answered my prayers and God speaks to my heart. There is a relationship, you know, and Pastor Chuck Smith has said, Prayer is not meant to be a monologue. It's a dialogue. But I think a lot of us as Christians, like I need to step back and I have to say, is it? Because seriously, sometimes like we say that, but really is it? Is it a dialogue? Is God really speaking to me? And if not, why not? So in our Christian walks, there needs to be a dialogue. I need to speak to God, but I need to be quiet and listen to him. And I once heard a, a, uh, a pastor speak about A.W. Tozer. Most of you know Tozer. Tozer brought him into his office. This is an evangelist by the name of Leonard Ravenhill. He's one of my favorites. And he came into Tozer's office, and Tozer said, sit down, Leonard. He says, you know, sometimes I come into my office, and I just tell my secretary to go on home and close the door and shut the door. And he says, I just get on the floor on my face for two, three, four hours silent, not even saying a word, just worshiping the majesty of God. He said, not even saying a word. He said, you know what worship is? It is silence. Worship in silence. I mean, and that is powerful. If I encourage you, if you haven't, you go home and in your devotions, you just get silent before God. And it is a powerful thing when you worship God in silence. But anyways, in Islam, God cannot be known. He is so transcendent. Praise the Lord that we can know our God. We can know Him. The Islamic view of God involves a form of agnosticism. Indeed, the heart of Islam is not to know God, but to obey Him. This is very interesting. I found this quote very interesting. It is not to know God, but to obey Him. Despite all the names of God in the Quran, in Orthodox Islam, we confront a God who is basically unknowable. And this was a quote from a book. So for them, it is, there is no such thing as knowing God. It is, I must obey him, and that's it. Allah is both good and evil. Check this out. Surah 4, verse 78. This is from the Quran. If some good befalls them, they say, this is from Allah. 
But if evil, they say, this is from thee, O prophet. Say, God is saying, say this, all things are from Allah. Okay? He's saying both the good and the evil come from me. That's what he is saying in the Quran. He leads some in righteousness and leads others astray. Okay, in the Quran, God can lead some to righteousness and he can lead. Okay, there's a difference between letting people, but he says he leads them astray. Surah 4, 119. I will mislead them and I will create in them false desires. Surah 14, verse 3. Then Allah sendeth whom he will astray and guideth whom he will. And other references there. He cannot be said to be unjust or wrong according to human standards. So this is once again interesting because he can cause evil or do evil, but you cannot say that God is unjust. Listen to what this guy said here. This is a Muslim, a Muslim uh, scholar. Imam al-Barqavi died in 1132. He can do what he wills, and whatever he wills comes to pass. He is not obliged to act. Everything good or evil in this world exists by his will. He wills the faith of the believers and the piety of the religious. He willeth also the unbelief of the unbeliever and the irreligion of the wicked. All we do, we do by his will. What he willeth not does not come to pass. If one should ask why God if one should ask why God does not will that all men should believe, we answer, we have no right to inquire about what God wills and does. He is perfectly free to will and to do what he pleases. So you know what that does? That takes complete responsibility off of humans. Yeah. You can do good, you can do evil. So, so how do you judge? Where is the justice of God? You understand? So there is there's no responsibility, no accountability. Okay. Described in the Quran as the greatest deceiver. This is really interesting. This gets even worse to me. God. God is described as the greatest deceiver. Surah 3, 54. And they, disbelievers, plotted. And Allah planned too. And Allah is the best of the planners. Now, once again, it's interesting because when you read the English translation, it is not what is in Arabic. And this is what helps. When you learn Arabic, you're like, you read the Arabic and you're like, okay, well, that's not what it says, my friend. Okay? And so that's why we write here the word for planners. It's not planners. Mekirina is the word for deceiver in Arabic. Okay? So he is the greatest or the best of deceivers. He says here, basically... The disbelievers, they deceive. He says, well, I am the best deceiver. Can you imagine? The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 1, I love it. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. This is the message that we have received from him. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There is none. Okay. So this is the God of Islam. Okay. So we are having, we have a picture now. You have an idea in the mind of a Muslim this is the God they worship. This is the God they, they know. Okay? Now next, they believe in prophets. According to Islamic tradition, there were 124,000 throughout history which came to teach and guide people to the true path. Okay? This is what they believe. How many prophets? 124,000 through their history. Now, among the prophets is another group called messengers. Okay, so there's a difference in the mind of a Muslim between a prophet, okay, prophet is a nebi in Arabic, and a messenger, which is rasul. And that is what they say when they refer to Muhammad. He is a messenger, or in English we say apostle. So they kind of use those words interchangeably, either an apostle or messenger. Okay, but in their call to prayer, has anyone in here uh, been to Israel? Okay, when you were in Israel, did you hear the call to prayer over the loudspeakers? Okay, there's a call to prayer five times a day, okay, and a Muslim anywhere in the world will pray five times a day if he's very religious, okay? 
in that call to prayer, the very first thing they hear is the confession of faith. And the confession of faith must be said in Arabic. Okay, but the confession of faith is this. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. Okay? So, among the prophets is another group called the messengers, of which Islam says there were 313 in total. Each of the messengers came with a particular book revealed for a certain people. The Quran specifically mentions only 25 by name. Okay, in the whole Quran, out of the 313, only 25 are mentioned by name. They are Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Lot, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Job, Samuel, David, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, John the Baptist, Jesus, and then you have here some that I have never heard of before. Salih, Hud, Shu'ib, and Dhul, Kifl, and then Muhammad. So interesting, huh? I bet a lot of you here didn't know that they even believed in a lot of these prophets, right? Enoch, Noah, Moses, they do. Okay, so once again, we have common ground. And a lot of the stories that are in the scripture, they also believe in. Okay, now once again, there will be details many times that are just twisted and changed. Okay, but these are those messengers that they believe in that came. Okay, so they believe in prophets. Next, they believe in holy books. Allah revealed from heaven four holy books. Okay, in the mind of every Muslim, there are only four holy books revealed from heaven. The Torah, the Psalms, the Gospel, and the Quran. Okay? And once again, I'm going to give you this in an index form uh, in, in Arabic. The Torah, Psalms, Zabur, Gospel, Injil, and then Quran. So keep in mind, a Muslim's understanding of these divine revelations is different from a Christian's. How the book was revealed. Okay, to who was it revealed? And length of time. It is completely different when you're talking to a Muslim and they say, I believe in the Torah. And you say, oh, I believe in the Torah, the books of Moses. Okay, what they're thinking is not what you're thinking. What we believe how it came to us is not how they believe it came. Okay? So they believe it was all given, for example, to Moses, and Moses wrote down everything himself. The, the, the Psalms, okay, they believe it, it all came to only David. So if they were to find like sons of Korah in the Psalms, oh, wait a minute, what's this? Okay. <laughs> now also in the, um, and then of course the gospel, we have, once again, this is a problem for them when they find out, oh, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And who is this apostle Paul writing this? Who is this man? Okay, they have a problem with that because for them, the gospel, one book came down to Jesus and Jesus gave it. Only him. Jesus is the one who spoke it all. So they don't understand where this Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John comes from. Okay, so the way we got it, the way we receive and believe is not the way in their mind the gospel came. Okay, just so you know. Okay, so it's different in the Muslim's mind. The Quran is referred to as the mother of the book. Okay, this is the way the, the Quran refers to the Quran, the mother of the book. In Surah 43, verses 3 through 4, we have made it a Quran in Arabic that ye may be able to understand and learn wisdom. And verily, it is in the mother of the book, in our presence, high in dignity, full of wisdom. And this Ali means the, the, the English translation. So the Quran says that the Quran was revealed in Arabic and it needs to stay in Arabic. Okay, this is another thing of their holy book. It must be in Arabic. And for a Muslim anywhere in the world, if he is to rightly understand the Quran, it must be read in Arabic. And this is where we, we, we differentiate. And I've had many discussions with Muslims. And it comes down to two things right here. For them, there is divinity, there is power, there is almost holiness in the language of Arabic. But for us, what is even the purpose of missions? Why is it that 
we have translated the Bible into so many languages. It is to get the gospel, the message, the spirit, the power of the message into people's hearts and minds in a way they can understand and then they can believe and put their faith in Christ and be saved. So for us, it is the message. And that message needs to get to every person. That's why missions exist. It needs to be translated. If those people have never heard it in their language, they need the Bible in their language. But for a Muslim, it must stay in Arabic. And so not only must the, the Quran be read in Arabic, but their prayers must be in Arabic. Very interesting. You cannot pray as a Muslim in English or Spanish or whatever language. It has to be in Arabic. So for them, it's like Arabic is divine and it needs to stay Arabic. No other language will be acceptable. Okay? So once again, they believe in these four holy books and this, this, is, very, this is very good. This is common ground. They believe in these, these four books and you can have a very good discussion concerning this with a Muslim. Next, angels and demons. Excuse me. So angels, they believe, created by God to serve him. Archangels, men, archangels mentioned in the Quran. Okay, so they believe in several archangels. Gabriel, he is the angel of revelation. Michael, he is the angel of providence. Israfil, he blows the trumpet of doom. Azrael, he is the angel of death. Ridwan, he is the guardian of paradise or heaven. Melik, is the guardian of hell. Malik means king. Munkar and Nakir, they are the two archangels that question the dead. And there are others. Okay, so they believe in these guardian, these archangels. And of course, what they believe, what was revealed to Muhammad, the angel Gabriel, he was the one that came to him in the cave. Okay, and gave him the Quran, began to give him revelations. There are recording angels, the good and the bad deeds. I told you about that, okay? They believe that every person in the world has two angels on both sides, okay? A good angel, uh, one angel recording the good deeds and one recording the bad deeds. Then you have what's called the jinn, okay? You, the, the Arabic pronunciation is jinn. And it's, guess what, guys? This is where we get the word genie. That's where it came from the Middle East, Look at a genie. He's Middle Eastern. It's actually this word here. It came from jinn. Okay? And it's jinn. It is a, what is a jinn? A different type of spirit being. It can be good or evil. Can enter also and possess humans. They can be male or female and they're created from fire. Okay? This is what Muslims believe. Okay? Many times there is, um, Actually, I think it's the holiday, the night of power, Laylatul Qadr. There is the 27th, the 27th evening in, the, in Ramadan. Okay, right now, the Muslims are, are in Ramadan, the, the month of fasting. The 27th night, they call it Laylatul Qadr, which means night of power. That is the night where the Muslims believe that Muhammad began to receive revelation from God. On that night, at least in Morocco, and it might be throughout the Muslim world, the women of the homes always start burning incense. And what will normally, what are they, what is the reason why they do that? Um, I think the incense is to try to, to ward off, the bad spirits away. to keep the bad spirits and away. Sometimes they dress up and put on lots of makeup and actually just dance. Yeah. Very yeah. And so they will, they will light incense. So, I mean, throughout our city, you know, you're smelling this incense, and it's kind of, yeah, it can be eerie. But you know what? You, you begin to say, we're going we're gonna to pray in the name of Christ, and we're going to lift up the incense of prayer. You know? And, um, and I tell you, it's, there's, there's warfare. There's warfare. But this is what takes place. And so they believe that these jinn can, can possess them, and so what they would do is they light this incense to ward off the evil spirits. What's that? They, they don't want the evil ones, at least. <laughs> Then there's Satan. Satan is of the jinn. Okay, so they believe Satan is part of the jinn category, and that's found in Surah 1850. They believe that Satan was created from fire, 
He was commanded by Allah to prostrate before Adam, along with all God's angels. This is interesting. He refused, so he was cast down from heaven and would give himself over to tricking and leading people away from Allah's straight path. And that's found in Surah 7, verse 16. And then you contrast that, of course, with the biblical account of Satan's fall. It is completely different. You know, when I first heard that, I was like shocked. God said for all of the angels, including Satan, to bow down to Adam. Okay? And that's why, because Satan refused, that's why he was cast down to the earth. So, of course, it's way different for us. The Bible says that Satan wanted to be like God. And there's the famous five I am statements. He says, I, or I will, I will do this, I will, I will, I will. And I think it's found in Isaiah chapter 14 and maybe Ezekiel 28, if I'm correct. But those are the accounts of, tells us what happened to Satan. Then we have what's called the divine decree. This has also been referred to as fate, fatalism, okay? The divine decree. Allah controls everything. Allah leads some astray and others he guides. In Surah 951, it says, Nothing will happen to us except what Allah has decreed for us. The term is used frequently, if God wills. Now, many Muslims use this term all the time. They'll say, Insha'Allah. Okay, there I have it in parenthesis. Insha'Allah. Okay, it means, if God wills. And it's interesting because... You will get in a, in a taxi. In Morocco, you get into a taxi and you say, to the airport, please. And they'll say, inshallah. They'll say, if God wills. And it's interesting when we talk to them about <laughs> eternal things concerning heaven and our eternal security. For them, they will say, if God wills, for everything. But even for their eternal destiny, whether they're going to heaven or hell, they'll say, Insha'Allah, I will go to heaven. So they don't know. And we've told them that for everything also, I said, we've told them as Christians, we also believe that God willing, we'll get from point A to point B and anything in life. The book of James tells us, don't say you're going to do this or that and be so confident. Don't boast. It says only if God wills, you will do this. But I've told them this, but there is the one thing that we do not say if God wills. And that's our eternal security. The reason why? Because God promised me. And if I say, God willing, I will be in heaven, then guess what? I'm calling God a liar. Because then God's word is not final and it's not authoritative. And so in the one area we cannot say, if God wills, it is in our salvation. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And of course, each one of us have to know that. We have to know for ourselves. And the Bible says, make your calling and election sure. And so they, they say that all the time, and it's very frequent. Now, this is uh, from the Hadith, from one of the traditions. And this is written by Sahih Muslim. This is one of the famous um, scholars. Verily, Allah has fixed the very portion of adultery which a man will indulge in and which he of necessity must commit. That is crazy. Okay, so literally they believe everything comes from God. Everything is fixed from God. He controls everything. It's very sad. Then there is final judgment. Okay, good and bad deeds will be weighed on a scale. This is what they believe. Okay, their good deeds will be weighed against their bad deeds. And if they have more good deeds, they will go to heaven. If not, they will go to hell. Muslims have no assurance of salvation, even after all they do. So they can, they can do all their prayers, they can go to Mecca, they can give to the poor, they can go to their Friday uh, meetings at the mosque, okay, because Muslims worship on Fridays, okay? Just as Jews on Saturday, Muslims are Friday, Friday is their holy day. They can do all these things and they still will not know if they can go to heaven. In fact, some have said, you can do all these things, and if God wants to, he can send you to hell because he can do whatever he wills. So Muslims have no assurance. They say, if God wills, I will enter paradise. Even Muhammad himself had no assurance. That blows me away. Even their own prophet had no assurance that he would go to heaven. 
The exception is martyrs in Islam. They are guaranteed paradise, okay? Now once again, our martyr in Islam is not our martyrs in Christianity, where we die because of our faith, okay? Our martyr for them is they are destroying lives where we in Christianity, martyrs are being destroyed. We are being killed for the sake of Christ. Okay? And then there is the belief in heaven and hell. Of course, there are many things that contrast with the biblical view. But generally, they believe in a heaven. They believe in hell. They believe there's a judgment day. Okay? So all these things. And then finally, man. Allah created Adam and Eve in heaven from the dust and were deceived by Satan to eat of the tree which was forbidden. God then cast them both from heaven to the earth to dwell there as a punishment. Okay, so note, take note. They don't believe that Adam and Eve were created on the earth in Eden. They believe Adam and Eve were created in heaven. Okay, out of dust. And then were deceived by Satan and then were cast to the earth. But they do believe there was a tree, the, the one tree that shouldn't be eaten from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They believe in that, okay? In Surah 2, verse 35 through 36, And we said, O Adam, dwell you and your wife in the paradise, and eat both of you freely with pleasure and delight, of things therein as wherever you will. But come not near this tree, or you both will be of the zalimun, which means wrongdoers. Then the shaitan, which is an Arabic Satan, made them slip therefrom, the paradise, and got them out from that in which they were. We said, get you down all with enmity between yourselves. On earth will be a dwelling place for you and an enjoyment for a time. So this is the, the text taken from the Quran. They believe man was created to worship Allah. Okay, once again, this is a common ground. Just as we believe that God created us to know Him, okay, and to worship the true God, they also believe that they were created to worship God. However, they believe that man was born without a sin nature, okay? They believe man is born sinless, okay? They believe man is born sinless, and they also believe that every person is born a Muslim, they believe all of us are Muslims. We're just not on the right path, and we need to be brought to the true path. That's what they believe. Okay, but they believe everyone is born without a sin nature. They also believe about man that concerning the prophets, they cannot sin. The prophets, they could not sin. So it's interesting because you do not have, for example, in the Bible, where we have a lot of the, the, the sins, of, of the prophets, which for us, it actually helps me because I see they're a man as I'm a man. It gives us hope. And if God can use them, then God can use me. If God used Abraham, who lied, if God used Noah, who got drunk, and you go on and on, Jacob, the supplanter, the deceiver, then God can use us. You know, Peter, you know, denying the Lord three times, but yet in the day of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit, he became a lion for the Lord, preaching the gospel. And you know what? The Bible tells us the reality. The prophets were men like us, but they, they, they were filled with God. But in the Quran, the prophets cannot sin. So while the Bible portrays God as absolutely holy and man is totally depraved, the Quran portrays man as simply weak and misguided. In the Muslim view, man does not need redemption. He only needs some guidance so that he might develop the inherently pure nature with which the Creator has endowed him. If he will be faithful in his prayers, almsgiving and fasting, God is likely to overlook his sins and usher him into paradise, a garden of sensual delights. Okay, so there is a vast difference. Okay, a vast difference. And you know what's very interesting? I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this. It's 8.30 now. For us, if you just, it's really amazing. But when you study the Bible and you just see the, the, the beauty of Scripture and behind everything, 
Our faith is centered in Christ. Our faith is centered in Christ. In heaven, Christ will be the center of heaven. But in the Muslim's heaven, you actually see and observe that everything is for the man. You have all these things for the man. And it's very humanistic. But in the Bible, it's all God. It's for his glory and for his honor. But you know what the beautiful thing is? And I've discovered this in my own walk. As I glorify God and as I make him the center of my life, and as I fully obey him, I receive pleasure. I am blessed. I am delighted. You know, when I was, you know, a lot of people have asked me, they've said, you know, how could you, you know, go to the mission field? How could you do that? You know, and when I was young, I said, I will never be a missionary. I would never do that. But the thing is this, God will never call you somewhere until he changes your heart and he makes that thing become your love and your passion. He will never call you somewhere until he makes that very thing literally burning in your heart like a fire. And that's what he does. You know, and, and serving God and serving the Lord, guys, and you can all testify, it's not a burden. It is our love. We are in love with Jesus. We are in love with Jesus because he was in love with us. You know, and I love I love the um, one of the songs that Phil Wickham wrote called Divine Romance. Because I think about that, that God, he romanced us in a, in a, in a spiritual way. And, I, and, and once again, I think about Muslims, I think they would not understand that song. If they read that, they would just say, wow, you guys are blaspheming here. But I think, you know, when I listen to that song, that is powerful to me. Because our God loves us. And he came down and he, he wooed us with his love. And he drew us to himself. And what a blessing to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, let's, let's close this time. Father, we thank you, Lord, for instructing us, Lord. We thank you for, for teaching us, Father, so that we can be equipped and ready for service, Lord. And Father, we just pray that, Lord, you would be with us tonight, Father. We pray that um, our time of questions and answers would glorify you, that our time of intercession would glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. It is not. It is not. So it's just from the sun, when the sun comes up till the sun goes down on Friday. I know clearly it was a fallen angel. It was a fallen angel. And it's for us. See, the thing is when we as we take the scripture and once again, the, the beautiful thing is and this is what and I could go on, but we sift everything through the word of God. This is a sifter, if you will. If it doesn't line up with this, I don't believe it. And that's why the Jews and the Christians of that day rejected Muhammad, because it didn't line up with Scripture. And exactly what you said. Paul warned us, he said, even if we are an angel from heaven, even if it was an angel, comes down and gives you anything that is slightly different, he said, reject it. He said, it is accursed. Galatians 1, 8, and 9. Yeah. from the Quran. Whatever is revealed to them, they do it. And they know what to do. They know to pray five times a day. They know what they need to do with fasting, giving. And all, we're going to look at that next week, the five pillars of faith for Islam. So they just do what they're told. That right there is an exception. I mean, someone involved with sorcery, there are, you know, just as you would find, you know, some cults you know, in, Christ, in Christianity, you know, so you have, you have those too. Folk Islam. Folk Islam, right. But the majority are not like this man at all. You know, that is, that is actually forbidden in Islam. It's, it should be www.searchtruth.net. But I can double check it. But if you do it, you know, you can check it, searchtruth.net or .com, but I'm pretty sure it's a .net. First of all, we have to understand that Muslims are not violent. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, we're going to look at this later on in the next uh, class about jihad, holy war. Okay, it is in the Quran, 
It is clear they are to do it. The majority of Muslims are not doing holy war. Just as, and it's, you know what, it's the same with Christianity. Just as the majority of Christians are not following the word of God. They're not practicing the Bible. That's what a fundamental Christian is. You're fundamental. You do. You practice the word of God. Literally from Genesis to Revelation. You know? But when a Muslim looks at United States of America, they think we're all a Christian nation. You know? And I have to tell them no. No. I tell them there are very few who are genuine Christians. And so remember that. Keep that in mind. They are not violent because they are not obeying. They're not doing what the Quran tells them to do. Okay? And once again, when Muslims from the Middle East assimilate into Western life, there's a lot of, you know, they get a lot of tolerance and being politically correct. And so all of that has infiltrated even their idea of Islam. And so that's why you'll see a lot of things. I mean, we were looking, we saw something on the Internet where in New York, I think, on the side of a bus, they're, they're trying to, like, just even show people, like, you know, Islam is, you know, for people. It's very sociable. And, you know, they're trying to present it in a very acceptable way, politically correct. You know what I'm saying? Like that jihad. Yes, that's what it was. Taking the word jihad because jihad is the word for um, striving. Literally, the word means to strive or fight. Okay? And it said, they, they have a website, I think, and they're calling it my jihad. You know, it's like everything is my. You know, like, I mean, nowadays, everything is my. You know, so they're saying my jihad is, you know, I struggle with my whatever, my idea on something, you know, and so they're trying to, to basically change it, soften it, exactly. He began to get control and power through when he was married to Khadija, his first wife. She was very wealthy, and so he began to, to gain a lot of wealth in that way. And, and then, of course, just the power of influence. Sure. You know, he began to just, you know, influence their minds and you know, with, as it, it just began to grow, the following, and, and they began to just, yeah, conquer. They wanted to conquer. But the whole point is to conquer the world to institute Islam. Islam needs to be covering the whole earth. You know, that's obviously their, their purpose. Just as for us, we want to bring Christ to all nations. We want, the Bible says, that righteousness may cover the earth as the waters cover the earth. You know, so it, it's, it's interesting. Obviously, the difference is, how we do that. And that's why I talked about Jesus told us to go forth and make disciples of all nations through the preaching of the word, you know. Whereas for them, they are commanded to do it and to subject those that fight against him. It's, it's very apparent when you read the account, the, histor the historical account, that he was either had epilepsy or he was obviously demon-possessed. Yeah. Because when he received his first revelation, his very first encounter with the angel Gabriel, he came running back to his first wife, and he was trembling. And he said he doubted that it was God. He believed that he, he did see a demon. A certain amount of revelation from the Quran came when he was in Mecca. So they call those the Meccan verses. And they were a bit softer. You know, more like, you know, be patient with those that reject the Islamic faith. You know, just try to convince and persuade them. If not, leave them. But then when he moved to Medina, that's what you call those the Medinian verses. Those are more on the offense, you know, more where he, more aggressive. Certain things, certain things they, they may interpret. I mean, the, but the majority of the, the most important things are the same. The Quran is the same in, throughout the, the Muslim world because that, that's what unites them. But it's those, it's what we're talking about here is how the succession, how it's, being, how it's passed is where they differ. And then, of course, there are certain, like I said, some differences, minor differences that they believe that are, some believe this way, the Shiites and then the, the Sunnis. Well, no, the Sunni have certain ones that they believe, and then the Shiite don't believe those. For them, it's just a holy site. This is what Abraham established, and this is, what, this is where God wants us to worship towards, towards this. But they, they wouldn't say that that's the presence of God. 
they wouldn't say that now. So it is, it is dis different than the Ark of the Covenant. This is, this is basically the, the eschatology of the Shiites, what they believe. They believe that through history there were 12, there are 12 almost like spiritual leaders. And then the 12th one is like to us equivalent to Christ coming back. So this is the Shiite eschatology. They believe the 12th imam, which is called the Mehdi, he will come and then establish God's kingdom on earth. So they call him the Mahdi. But once again, the majority of Muslims are, are Sunni. But this is, yes, this is what the Shiites believe. A lot of the violence in, in Iraq is between Sunnis and Shiites. I mean, blowing up each other's mosques and things like this. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it can get pretty bad. I think it's very good to say I'm a follower of Jesus. I think that's, uh, that's wise. There are certain things in our message that are points in their mind that are, are stumbling blocks for them. Okay? And those stumbling blocks for a Muslim, immediately if you were to say, the Christian, what comes to your mind? They would think of the cross and they would think of the Son of God. Those two things in their mind is what sticks out in their mind. That's what stumbles them. That's what causes them to say, this is not from God. And that's why we're, our memory verse is the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. You know, because the gospel must offend. And this is the problem we're having today in our society. We don't have a message that offends. But 1 Corinthians 1 says, for the Jew it was a stumbling block, and for the Greek... It was an offense, okay, because Christ, he was offensive to both, and yet he came and, and he says, on whomever, whoever falls on this stone will be broken, and on whomever it falls will be crushed to powder. So the gospel message is meant to, to stumble, it's meant, it's meant to offend. But I like what Pastor David said once, he said, let's make sure that the gospel is what offends, not me that offends them.